wintertime is uh, a time where, for some reason, in my mind anyway, um, I remember different happenings as a kid and even as an adult. And that maybe it's because wintertime you kind of slow down, you have to, you know, slow down or crash. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, there's, some, there's some great memories and then there's some not so great, you know. Uh, wintertime, to me as a kid, there were some funerals in my life. You know, I had great uncles and grandparents that passed away. It always seemed like the funerals were on a gloomy, snowy, cold, wintry day. And then there's the memories of growing up, we were poor folks. We didn't, I didn't know it, but we were poor. And uh, we heated our house with coal. And we lived in Colorado, and so we didn't have an abundance of, you know, timber around to put in the fireplace. So we had a coal burning stove. And that was my job. I got to haul the coal into the house, you know, big old rocks of coal. And I can remember laying in bed, um, and they would stoke that fire up, and it was nice and warm. In fact, the belly of the stove and it took on a red glow. <laughs> yeah, and that would scare a, a fireman, probably. <laughs> but it was, to, it was a cozy feeling. It was warm. It was 40 below zero outside. But in this little house with hardly any insulation, it was a home. And I was loved, cared for, and poor. But I didn't know it. Things were great. Uh, but for some reason, you know, Winter time is, is that time that uh, some of those memories are really vivid. And uh, summertime, you know, you just have fun all summer. You know, there, <laughs> there are some special moments. And they build up flushing toilets in the house. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> no, that's another time, another story. But <laughs> anyway, uh, snow is a reminder, a song, you know, we used to sing every time the first snow, you know, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me whiter than snow. Just a good reminder of how consistent our God is in all things, and he's in control of all things. Sometimes we forget that. And uh, we're here to fellowship with one another, to remind one another, don't forget that. Encourage one another, love one another. Thanks for being here this morning on this beautiful, snowy morning.
praise the Lord. Great, good, and healthy words to sing. But uh, summer special. For only some of sins to die. Thank you. 
I was talking to somebody this morning out in the lobby and I said, you know, I used to really love the snow until I got old enough where my dad would say, you know, you're not going to school today until you shovel that sidewalk. Boy, was I late for school a lot. <laughs> and I used to blame it on my parents for being late, that I was late to school. But they had a, an, an amazing insight. If I just would get up a little earlier, after the alarm went off, then I might get to school on time. How about that? And I'm still struggling with snow because all my kids have grown up and left home now. But I love my kids, and I love your kids, and I'm so glad that we have them here today, and some of them are going to go to children's church today. So let's pray for them before they go. Lord, thank you for the children that you've given us at any age in our church family. And I pray for them today, Lord, as, as the little ones leave and go to the children's church and our children's workers today. Father, would you be a blessing to these workers and through them, to our children, that they might, that the little ones might understand who Jesus is a little bit better today, and that they might grow in what it means to have a relationship with you. Thank you for them, and would you, would you guide us through our time today as well? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, little ones, you may be dismissed to Children's Church. Workers is going with them. I remember that when I was a, a little kid, in the wintertime, one of the things that my mom would say to me frequently is that her dad, my grandpa on my mom's side, was going to be coming up from California in the spring, and I could not wait to see my grandpa. I only saw him once a year. And that's when he would come up from California and lived in the Torrance area and uh, would come up. And I was excited about it. Then January, February rolls around. I want to know, when are we going to go? When's the first time we can go camping? I want to go camping. I said, so, well, we're going to go camping on such and such a day. So we can't go during this time, this time of the spring. Well, why not? Well, because remember, your grandpa's coming up. Oh, yeah. And then we, we get on through the winter time and then toward the spring time a little bit. And, well, when are we going to go camping? Well, we can't go this weekend because your grandpa's coming up. And they kept getting the, the phrase, and I kept forgetting about it. And then one time, my grandpa showed up. Grandpa, boy, I'm glad to see you. Well, didn't anybody tell you I was coming? And I actually couldn't remember if they had or not. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't listening. I don't know. Marilyn says sometimes I don't listen, but I think it's my memory more than my ears. Okay, we're going to move off that topic. So, but the whole idea that somebody told me ahead of time, all of these songs that we sang this morning have to do with the coming of Christ and what he's accomplished for us. And did you know we've been told before about that? And that's kind of what we're going to go through. This whole season of Advent, it sounds odd, but we're going to talk about the theology of the cradle. You think theology, oh man, that's a yawner. Well, let's just see about that, because there's some good stuff that's in here. The first area of theology we're going to talk about during this whole season is the idea of prophecy. And the whole fact that they said he was going to come, they said he was coming, but their predictions about when he was coming and what his first advent was going to be like was drawn out over a long period of time. And there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about the life of Christ in the New Testament, but there's over 300 just related to his first advent, to his first coming, related to Christmas and, 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 and what Jesus accomplished in his first advent as he came. So in your sermon notes, you've got some blank lines. Those first blank lines are right there. You can put in prophecy in one, and they said he was coming in the other, and that kind of fills in the top part of your sermon notes as you're following along there in your bulletin. We're going to have six areas, and so it's over 300. So aren't you thankful I didn't cover all 300 and some this morning? Amen. I got one amen out of you. All right. Let's go from here. And today it's just going to be a sampling. Just a sample. And you might think at the end of today's message, well, you didn't say this one or you didn't say that one. Well, let me know and we'll extend the message next time a lot. But I got quiet. Okay, let's go on from there. Okay, so in your notes, 
We're going to give you a scripture passage uh, where it's a prophetic idea in, in our Old Testament. And then the theme related to that. And then either we'll talk about where it's fulfilled in the New Testament or we'll just put a little reference up there. Here's the first one. Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Genesis 3, 14, and 15, his first prophecy. Now this isn't talking about a first prophecy that Jesus made. It's the first prophecy about Jesus in the, in the Bible. And it has to do with the whole time when Adam and Eve were created. They were in a garden that was beautiful. It was perfect. Adam and Eve were sinless. And they hadn't had an argument yet. And everything was good. And then in chapter 3, that old snake shows up. And he tempts them, and they both fall into sin. And so chapter 3 has to do with the fall of mankind, their first step into the, the cesspool of sin, and then some of the consequences. And he starts the first thing that happened. Adam, where are you? Now, it's not as though God didn't know. But Adam and Eve were hiding. They couldn't face God because of their sin. Where are you? And he says... I was naked and I hid. Adam, number one, who told you you were naked? Number two, did you eat from that fruit I told you not to? Anybody who's read Genesis chapter 3 might remember what Adam's response was. It was what? Oh Lord, you're right, I take no responsibility. <laughs> what was it? She did it. Yeah. The woman you gave me. So he's standing, he's Passing the buck twice this defective product, and by the way, it came from you. And so God doesn't argue with that. He just lets him stand there and take responsibility. And then he turns to the woman. Now ah, that snake, you deceived me and everything. And then he turns to the snake. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit about this. About him and it, it's it, he talks to the, the serpent. And we know who the serpent was. It was the devil. In verse 14, Genesis chapter 3, the Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman. The enmity is kind of a fancy way of saying enemyship. It's easier to say Enmity, but it's a whole idea of being, a, there's a state of war. All right? So I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now we get kind of caught up in that. But between your seed and her seed, in other words, between your seed, Satan, and all that follows after you and your domain and all that you stand for, there's going to be enmity between you and her seed. Now you can take that one of two ways. You can either say everyone that follows after her, but it doesn't say seeds, it says seed. One individual. And we know that to be Christ and what he stands for. Well, let's read that in that context. So between your seed and her seed, and he, who's the he? The one individual that God's talking about here. And he shall bruise you on your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, to get your head smashed is pretty much fatal. To get your, your ankle smashed or crushed or hurt, that hurts. Uh, some of you have had the Achilles tendons snap back at you. Some of you have had a really bad sprained ankle. I remember one time when I was in college, and uh, before Marilyn and I were married, I was in college, I was on the wrestling team, and my, one of my jobs at nighttime was to, I was the nighttime janitor from 10 at night until two in the morning. And that was what I did for part of my job. And uh, so we get done with our work early, and one of the things that was always fun to do, in the cafeteria, which is what we helped clean up, and there was some luscious stuff left over in the garbage can, but that's another story. But they had these spring-loaded tray racks. So you take a, tray, a, a cafeteria tray off the rack and the spring would push it up just a little bit. Take another one off, push it up. So you get a whole bunch of those suckers on there and that baby's heavy. 
but you pull it off and leave the last one, and you get up on the ramp. Let's see how high you can jump. Can we touch the ceiling? Well, I'm far from the ceiling as anybody. We got up there, and I jumped as high as I could, and when I came down, the side of my foot hit the edge of that tray, went down about halfway, and the tray wanted to come back up, took my ankle and went, ah! That still hurts when I think about it. I got a badly sprained ankle. But I made through it, it was horribly painful. I lived through it. Which would you rather have, a crushed head or a sprained ankle? I hate to consider either one of those, but I'd take that anyway. It was the first prophecy about Christ. Satan was going to hurt Jesus severely. On the cross, Jesus died, but it didn't end his life. <laughs> no, he came back to life again. But what Jesus accomplished on the cross secured your salvation, and someday even death itself will be put to death and thrown into the lake of fire. All because of what Christ has done. And so this whole state of war between Satan and mankind, in fact, Jesus himself said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And so that's what he's talking about there. This first prophecy about Christ it starts at the very beginning of the Bible. Not all is lost. Yes, Adam and Eve sinned. They shouldn't have sinned. It's infected the entire human race forevermore afterwards. But when Jesus was coming, and yes, Satan will be allowed to bruise the heel of Jesus, and that was a painful experience on the cross, but Jesus endured for us. But the end result is crush Satan, eradicate him, get rid of him, and someday that will happen. This whole prophecy about Christ's coming, even from the very beginning of the book, they said he was coming, and he did. Number two comes from the, the minor prophet Micah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It actually talks about the birthplace of Christ. Now, some people think, well, you know, this Jesus, he could have manufactured a lot of things about his life to could go back and look at where all of his prophecies were and sort of uh, manipulate circumstances to make him, everybody think he was Messiah. Well, how do you, inside the womb of your mother, say, um, I think we should uh, stop here in Bethlehem and we'll give birth there? It doesn't happen that way. Uh, God organized it another way. But in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, but from you shall uh, come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, who com whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. And there's so much depth. So much breadth in there that we couldn't exhaust it all today. But as Micah records, in fact, he probably didn't understand the full impact of what he was saying there. Bethlehem, you're hardly even worth noting. You're in the tribe of Judah, and obviously Jerusalem is the place, the mighty place. That's the capital right there. But Bethlehem, you're too little to be even to be recognized from them, but from you shall come forth for me one who is ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. In other words, Jesus is eternal. There is no beginning or end. So I remember, where did that get fulfilled? In Matthew chapter 2. It's not up on the screen, but I'm going to give it to you. Matthew chapter 2. I want to read just the first six verses, and you'll begin to get the flavor of that. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired from them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And then he quotes this passage. They quote this passage. Herod didn't know where this king was supposed to be born. But he went to the wise men. He went, I mean, not the wise men. He went to the, the ruler, the spiritual rulers of the city of that day. And he says, well, where is this Christ guy supposed to be born anyway? So they went and made careful search of the scripture. 
And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet Micah, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so here in this passage, we find it is fulfilled in that, in that passage. And so basically, they said he was coming. And there's another, and this is only, we're going to only take six of the over 300 ones that we're talking about. The third one comes out of Isaiah 61, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, what I'd like you to do is we're going to look at two passages here. We're going to look at the Isaiah passage, so if you want to look it up right on the reference, put a marker there. And so I want us to start, if we could, in Luke chapter 4. We're going to read what happens in Luke chapter 4 first, and we're going to see how it's a reflection of what happened in Isaiah 66. So I'm going to start first in Luke chapter 4. And we'll start at verse uh, 16. And he, meaning Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is, up, is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the, con of the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's so why you think, oh, that's nice. He has fulfilled that. But if you go back and you read the Isaiah passage, Jesus stopped right in the middle of a verse. So he stopped in, 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 in the Luke passage, in the Luke 4 passage, he stopped right at verse 19 to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus came to proclaim. And so he, sit, he sits down and he starts to preach that. And I've only had to creak sitting down a couple of times. I had a blood clot in my leg once, and they said, you can't get up and walk around or stand up or nothing. But Jesus, that was, was the custom, sat down to preach, and he said, today, what he just read has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, keep that in mind. Let's go back to Isaiah 61 and see where he quoted and where he stopped short. In Isaiah 61, I'm going to start at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And it stops. Jesus' reading of that stops right in the middle of verse 3 from Isaiah 61. Let me finish the verse. Verse 2, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So Jesus didn't quote that. Because that part is not going to be fulfilled until the tribulation and the second coming. So Jesus took that, middle, that first part and said that right there. And in the process, he said, that's the way it is going to be. And he didn't quote the rest because that hasn't ha happened yet. So he says, it, it's going to happen in, uh, uh, I mean, it, today, that first part is fulfilled in your hearing. So even Isaiah, back in those days, he knew they knew that he was coming. They said that he was coming. All right, the next one. Psalm 69, verses 7 through 9. And it talks about a zeal for the house of God. A zeal for the house of God. Let me just read that passage for you if I could. Psalm 69, verses 7 through 9. 
And this is just a quotation, I mean, a, a part of Psalm, and we're going to see how it's fulfilled in the New Testament. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, for zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproach of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now this is actually fulfilled in John chapter 2. So I'm going to read that passage in John chapter 2 where it happens. In John chapter 2, uh, you know what, before I go there, the zeal, the passion that Jesus had for worshiping his Father from the human side. We come, we enjoy the worship music that our worship team has worked on and prepared. And boy, the Christmas program coming up, you're going to hear a whole orchestra and singing. We're going to enjoy it, and it's going to be great. There's something about that, that whole singing process that helps us come before the throne of God in music. But in this one here, there is such a zeal that Jesus has to be about his father's business, to be with the, doing the things that God wants, to be in this house of God that was the, the, the temple, to worship him and to teach others. And the word zeal, it has to do with just his passion for this. It was his food. And it goes back even earlier than, than that to his childhood. Next week, you're going to hear about, in our next message, you're going to hear about this part. Let me just read for you a small part of Luke chapter 2, verses 46 to 49. Luke chapter 2, 46 to 49. Now this is, has to do with the time when Jesus was at about 12 years old. His family would go from Nazareth all the way from there to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It was a great family gathering. All the way people would be together. Him and what we know to become John the Baptist were probably second cousins. Family would go together. They'd go down and come back. And he just kind of got mixed with the family. In the process, when the family got packed up and leave after the Passover, they got going. And all of a sudden, they looked around. And Mary and Joseph were saying, well, where is Jesus? I don't know. They looked around and they called the other tents around. They couldn't find him anywhere. So they went back to Jerusalem. My goodness, we forgot the kid. Have any of you, buddy, left a kid or the rest off before? Don't raise your hand. We won't go there. Okay, but they searched around for Jerusalem. Uh, the terror in Mary's heart. Can you imagine? I know he's 12. He should be responsible enough to keep up. But they looked for him for three days. Luke chapter 2, 46 to 49. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Because your father and I have been searching for you in, in distress. And he said, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Some versions will say, I must be attending to my father's affairs. as a passion or a zeal that was there even as a young person. That's one thing I really want us to appreciate about the young people in our church. They're not just almost people. And you get to somehow be a person when you're an adult. The young people in our church, the children that are now in children's church, and our teenagers and the youth group, and the group, they're people that are a significant part of our church family. You're going to get a chance to hear them as they lead the entire church service next Sunday. <laughs> are we excited about that? Yes. <laughs> Not getting much excitement out of the kids. But yeah! yeah. Alright, I'm excited about it. But, but the whole idea as a young person, Jesus had a, a vision or a passion for what he knew. God's business was, and he needed to be there. And that reveals a little bit about the zeal that he had. Now, if we go over farther in his adult life, in, in his adult life, in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, John chapter 2, 13 through 17, as an adult, the Passover of the Jews at that hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. Now, I'll stop there for just a minute. 
<clears throat> the custom, and many of you have heard this before, is that when you come from afar, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a festival that everyone comes to Jerusalem and Passover, you sacrifice a lamb, you have to be there in Jerusalem to do it. It's much easier to buy one there than to haul it all the way from home. You're supposed to sacrifice a perfect lamb. Well, what happens if this thing twists its ankle on the way or gets cut for, by something or attacked by an animal? Then it's not perfect, it's flawed. And so, oh, I wasted all that. So oftentimes they would just get one when they get there. Well, the money changer people thought, ah, oh, this is an opportunity to make a few dollars here. So they get a bunch of, of sheep ready to go and they'd make sure they were perfect, they were sacrificial quality. But boy, when you came to buy the price, they jacked the price up. Some of you have noticed that when you go to the store, sometimes on Black Friday you can get a great deal. But sometimes on Black Friday, it's been reduced by 30%. Price has been reduced 30%, but you look at it compared to what it was last week, and it was 45% higher the week before. So you're not getting that much of a discount on that process. But there they would jack the price up. And since the temple was so holy, you can't just use common street currency. You have to use our currency because our money's pure. So they have to go to the exchange booth first. They would exchange a common currency for temple currency. And they would rip them off for the exchange rate. Then you go buy the lamb. It's, the price had been jacked way up for Passover. So these money changers, boy, they were making profit on two ends, on the currency exchange and on selling the overinflated price for the sacrificial lamb. Jesus got ticked about this. He was mad. Let's go on in, in uh, John chapter 2. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? Wow, what a day of righteous chaos that must have been. Get him out of here. And he was, he, it wasn't so much for the, against the, the, a legitimate sale. He was so much against the unrighteousness of all that was going on that was there. And yet, in fact, you've made, you have made what's going on here a day of commerce than a day of worship. Now, I have no problem. In fact, we're talking about a bake sale coming up here shortly. And we can do bake sale stuff like that to raise money for kids going to D.C. I think that's a great idea. I hardly encourage you to support that. <clears throat> but the unrighteousness of the, the currency exchange, the unrighteousness of the, the jacked-up prices on the animals, they're more interested in a dollar than worshiping God. And Jesus had had enough. So we go on, he, he says, you've made my house, a, rather than a house of worship, a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now they're going back to Psalm 69 on that. Ah, Psalm 69. They said he was coming, and that's kind of a repeated phrase throughout the process. We've got two more passages to go. Isaiah 53. Last week I had to reading Isaiah 53. I, 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 I first thought, let's just take the entire book, uh, chapter of Isaiah 53 and work through the process. And there's so much to cover there. I mean, maybe we'll do that some other time. But I just then chose it as one part of this message. But in Isaiah 53, <coughs> this is before Jesus ever came. This is before they know everything that we know. We look at the scene looking back over history. In Isaiah's day, they were looking forward through a cloud. And they couldn't see the details as clear as we can see them looking back. But this is what Isaiah recorded for them. Isaiah, I'm just going to read part of it, verses 2 through 6. And this really talks about the mission of Christ. For he grew up, for he, Jesus, grew up before him, God, or the Father, like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. And the whole idea, we're just going to talk our way through this one. The whole idea there, parched ground, there was a spiritual drought 
during the time when Jesus was there. Uh, obviously, the part of the job was these, these unrighteous money changers and people in the, in the temple. But even the Pharisees had gotten so strict and so ordered in what they did, they missed the intent of the law rather than just driving around the, the, the letter of the law. And then it talks some more about Jesus. He had no stately form or majesty that we would look upon him. In other words, there's nothing tall about him. Uh, he was a Jew. The, 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 the Semitic race generally tends to be a little bit shorter. You'd never see a, an Andy walking around and he'd be head and shoulders and waist above a lot of them. Uh, I might be tall for a Jew. There were just shorter people. So there was no stately posture and walking through the room as though you owned it. No, he was just a guy that blended into the crowd. No stately form that we should uh, look upon him. No appearance that we should be attracted to him. He didn't have that large jawbone with that little cleft thing going on in there and, and the high cheeks and the glaring eyes and the hair. I can't flip my hair as much now as I used to be able to. Neither can you, Dean, so we're good. But the whole idea, there was nothing about Jesus that, that stood out to where he think is beautiful eyes, beautiful face, tall stature, muscular, uh, he was just a guy that blended in. He was just normal, ordinary looking in the crowd. But verse 3 goes on, not just to his physical appearance, but really how he was treated. And as Isaiah wrote this, he writes it in the past tense, as though it had already happened. And we know in God's economy, there is no future or past. It's always the present. In, in God's perspective, he sees everything as the now, even though for us it hasn't happened yet. But he said in verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This is Jesus we're talking about here. Jesus, what do you mean acquainted with grief? Well, we know that historically his, his earthly dad, Joseph, probably died when he was shortly after 12, early on in his life. And it's painful to have a parent, provider for the family to die. He was acquainted with grief. We know that he was treated poorly by his, his younger brothers. They, they chastised him for going off and trying to be a missionary or something. And like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. In other words, all that Jesus went through, we just took it for granted, we didn't esteem him. Boy, that's kind of true for a lot of us today. He was despised, and we didn't respect or esteem him. Verse 4, this is what he did for you. Surely, our griefs he bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5. He was pierced through for my transgressions. I know that says our transgressions. But the word my also fits. He was pierced through for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. I, I don't like to think about my transgressions and my iniquities, but folks, I got them. By the way, it's probably not a surprise to you, you got a few of them yourself. We all do. And it says that Jesus was pierced through because of that. Not just because of that, but to fix it what my transgressions and what my iniquities did to forever and hopelessly block my access to God, block my access to heaven, block my access to anything good in this life, Jesus fixed it. He was pierced through for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. And the chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourgings we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus did that for you. 
And sometimes it's just good to come back and consider what he really went through for all of us. That's his mission. His mission to come as he did. He left the glories of heaven to enter the glories of earth. And he did that. His mission was to redeem you. I don't ever want to take that light. And folks, it is so easy to do. But this passage ends with the price he paid for me and you. But I'm so glad that it doesn't end there. There's one more. In Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11, there's some hope there about the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> the writer of this psalm says, I, will, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. All my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Now, when we run across, we'll stop there for just a moment. When we run across prophetic scriptures about the life of Christ in the Old Testament, sometimes it sort of goes in and out of, a, of the scene of the time it was written and in and out of the scene of the time it predicts. And so you're kind of not sure who it's talking about here, but as it begins to focus and narrow, it's sort of like this is Jesus speaking ahead of time to whoever wrote this particular psalm. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Why? For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or death or let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus was dead for three days. And yet God did not allow decomposition or corruption of his flesh to set in. Verse 11, you make known to me the path, uh, make known to me the path of life. And in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Wow. They said he was coming. And it's over the period of time. We still got a, a little bit more than 295 of these prophecies to go. Okay, we won't go anymore, but there's the flavor of it right there. He did all this to come from the very beginning to the time where he ascended into heaven, when he, when he, was rose, when he rose from the grave, and all of that was told to us way a long time ago. And we just happened to see a few little spots. Now you might be thinking, oh, while we're here, well, he didn't mention this passage, or he should have mentioned this one, and could have gone there. Yep, I could have, and I thought about it, but I didn't. We're over time, anyway. Is that okay? Bless your heart. You didn't answer. Okay, let's take, take it home. There's a meditation and a premeditation. The meditation has to do with he did this for you. Even you. Now, it, it, you could personalize this and say he did it for me. Even me. And that last phrase, even you or even me, is there for you to personalize it. So just throughout the day, throughout the week, remember that everything we've read this morning, he did it for you. Even you or even me. And you've heard the story, if I'd have been the only person that never lived in the face of the earth, that sin, Jesus would have come and redeemed me of my sin. That was promised to Adam and Eve, and they were the only persons that ever lived in the face of the earth. God still promised ahead of time the Messiah to come and fix that for them. And so yes, he can do that even for one or, or two. He did that for you, even you. Now, to set us ahead, uh, you can be praying this week for Mikey as he prepares the message for next Sunday. You can be praying for our youth as they lead us in our worship service next week. And there'll be multiple passages. He's going to take an area of theology of the cradle, kind of work through our same sort of a theme here. And in the process of doing that, he's going to cover one of the passages that we talked about today. Luke, 20, Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And this will cover the idea of when Jesus was at the temple. Um, and just kind of get the flavor. Now, if you want extra credit, anybody want extra credit? <laughs> Read the entire second chapter of Luke. It's good stuff. 
all the way through. Don't miss it. So, as per Mikey's instruction, Luke chapter 2, 41 to 52. Extra credit, read the entire chapter. It won't kill you. It might save you. All week long. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your Son. Thank you for the promise of redemption that you've given to us. Thank you that you did tell us a long time ago what was going to happen. And then you saw to it that it did happen at the first coming of Christ. And all that he has done for us. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen. Would you like to stand, please?